I didn't figure out public health probably until my junior year of, of college. Um, beginning because I was a part of a fraternity on campus, Alpha Phi Fraternity Incorporated, Ada Chi Chapter, shout out to ULM. Um, <laughs> and with my, a lot of the guys that I came in, my line brothers, we were all a part of the health science degrees. So we had someone in nursing, someone in pharmacy, someone in biology, someone in occupational therapy. So me being the volunteer coordinator in doing community uh, service, one of the things we used to do would do uh, just monthly little events or seminars out on the student union building on campus. And so one day we might do a cervical care, a cervical health um, seminar for women, or we might have a testicular cancer and prostate cancer awareness for the guys. We, we used to do STD um, check-ins, pass out condoms. So that was kind of like what I was doing in the realm of public health, not realizing it. This is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, episode number 45. Hi everyone, Omari Richens here. Welcome my new plant. I don't know if any, if anyone has any name suggestions, I will take them. Um, but thank you all for joining me today. I hope that everyone is doing well. Um, I'm really glad to have this guest on. And, and I know there are definitely some great insights in here and some great tips that everyone can take on their journey. So definitely just tune in, enjoy, uh, subscribe, like, leave a review, share it with your friends, with your mom, with your dad, whoever. I appreciate you a lot. And uh, without further ado, here's today's episode. Enjoy. Today, we have a passionate health policy and management graduate interested in preventative health interventions, health program planning, grant writing, and translational research. He got his Bachelor's of Science in Health Studies at the University of Louisiana at Monroe. He has worked as a STEM summer camp director, ER Patients Access Associate, before, before going on to, to get his Master's of Public Health at Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, or FAMU. He is now a Doctor of Public Health student at FAMU and works as a medical health care program analyst at the Agency for Healthcare Administration. We have Nicholas Alford, MPH. Welcome to the show. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Like I've, I'm trying to be more intentional and in trying to get more men on it and more black men on it. So like, I'm, I'm glad that you're here to, to tell your story. Yes, we, we need that. It's not many of us in the field or many of us that are known. Yeah, like if, if you want to go to the side notes here, like, like I was intentionally going through like my LinkedIn contact looking for black men to get on the show. And I do, I do not have like more than I want to say 15 yeah in contacts with black men which which kind of disappointed me so i definitely i'm trying to expand my uh my connections on linkedin as well but that's just a side note so how are you doing how you been coping during these times i'm i'm doing good i'm doing good coping wise i have definitely learned to uh get out my house <laughs> uh going out for walks and jogs just getting that that vitamin d from the sun breathing in fresh air that's really been doing uh really been one of my coping mechanisms as well as uh, coloring books. Mm -hmm. Coloring books are very soothing. If you don't have a coloring book, try it. I'm not a big painter or doodle, doodler, mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll color in a minute. <laughs> so right. that's been my, my activities for coping. Yeah, that's dope. That's dope. Like I, I was literally at the grocery store today and I saw a coloring book there and I almost picked it up. Like I, I'll definitely have to order one because I've I have done that in the past, but I haven't done it in a really long time. So that's dope that you're doing that. Yeah, uh, man. Mm -hmm. Get a coloring book and just let some music play. Mm -hmm. That's why I buy it. <laughs> Definitely feel you. Uh, so how do you identify and tell us a little bit about your personal background? Okay, I identify, my pronouns are he, him, his, bro. Um, I am the, I'm 28 years old. I am the youngest of four from a small town called Hammond, Louisiana. I know a lot of people don't know Hammond, so I always tell them we're about 50 miles north of New Orleans. Everybody knows New Orleans or we're about 40 minutes east of Baton Rouge. Everybody knows those two cities. So we're right there in the middle. 
Uh, we call it ham in America, where if you don't know somebody, you know their parents. If you don't know their parents, you know somebody that's related to them. So uh, friends uh, will call me random at most. <laughs> I'm, I'm very random outside of the workplace. Everybody else just thinks I'm very cool, calm, and collected, <laughs> put together. But uh, like I said, I'm I'm random. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad that that definitely means they have like a, a nice personality to be around, which, which is awesome. And, yeah, and and I'm interested to see like how how your uh, public health 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 administration journey has has gone coming from like the small the small place in Louisiana as well. Um, so, what does public health mean to you? Uh, public health to me, I would definitely say that it's the the fundamental uh, stepping stone for us to to reach to where we want to go as far as developing the communities that we want to see. Because um, if you think about it, everything is public health and we don't realize it. The, the air we breathe, the water we drink, housing, the roads that we drive on, um, seatbelt laws, everything is public health. And I think people don't realize that because we're such uh, in our country, we're so focused on the healthcare field, such as the physicians and medications and therapies. But I think if we kind of use that public health approach, uh, going into a lot of things, that having that solid foundation, looking from the outside in, uh, that could really help us get to where we want to go. So that's what public health to me. It's everything, yet it's the the foundational stepping stone. Yeah, and I completely agree with that. And it doesn't get the credit that it deserves. All, all these other fields, medicine, pharmacy, all those other fields get a huge amount of credit, but public health does so much and it's undervalued, underfunded, and underappreciated for everything that it does. Definitely. I if if you were to act if people would ask me, what am I doing? I say I'm getting a degree in public health. They'd be like, oh yeah, we need more people like that. But you ask them what is public health, they wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. The only thing that comes to people's mind is either the CDC or of course, most recently COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So that, that, and that was probably everyone's, a lot of people's introduction to public health. Yeah, that, that is correct. That is correct. And I feel like it, it gives us an opportunity to educate and pe give people the opportunity to know about different public health paths. Because as you said, like public health is everything. So there's so many ways to, to touch public health. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. And like in, in your intro, I, I said that uh, you're interested in translational research. So what is translational research? So translational research is basically, it's built off this concept that uh, many people have known as from bench to bedside research. And that's basically just taking basic research, uh, the basic um, theories of research and see how does that translate or how can that be applicable to the healthcare field. So for instance, let's say I'm interested in um, patients, breast cancer patients that end up having cardiovascular diseases. Well, I, based off that uh, research, I could possibly, you know, use that research and there could be a therapy or some type of device used as people are going through chemotherapy or radiation to kind of help the development of those cardiovascular diseases as they're going through that process. So that's just an example of that, but that's basically what it is. Okay, and not to get into this, but is this is that why you decided to get your DRPH to like more act more partially? Actionable? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess we will get into that a little later. Um, so, get mm -hmm. into your, your undergrad. You got your bachelor's of science in health studies at the University of Louisiana at Monroe. So, what was the thought process for getting your undergrad degree or going into school? Uh, well, going into school, uh, of course, everybody has these big dreams of definitely going to be a doctor or something like that. So I definitely went in uh, wanting to be either a pharmacist or a, a uh, radiologic technologist some, or working with nuclear medicine because mm -hmm. uh, my mother, she was diagnosed with breast cancer when I was like 15, 16. So that's why I took that interest. And then, of course, having elderly um grandparents, one having dementia, I would kind of help her with her medication. So those were the two forces that led me to those fields. But after uh, encountering biology and chemistry, 
uh, finding out that those weren't my strong suits. And so I saw that we had a health studies uh, degree mm -hmm. and it split off into two tracks. There's a pre-professional where people can go into occupational therapy, physical therapy, or anything in the allied health field. And then there was a management and marketing sector. And I went towards the management and marketing sector because I was like, ooh, I can be like the CEO of the hospital. I can, that could be my contribution to health and healthcare, you know, trying to help people that way. So that's how I landed in that degree, in, in that degree uh, program. And I, I loved it. It was a combination of everything. So I still got those health sciences. I got the management, the marketing, the psychologies, and all, all those things that I was interested in wrapped up in one degree. Okay, so that's, that's what kind of led me to that. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I want to ask more about like the marketing parts because I feel like a lot of people in health sciences and public health don't really have like a marketing background. So, so tell me about like what what different mm -hmm. things in, in health science marketing did you learn? Uh, one thing that I learned in marketing is definitely um, how we market things, knowing the the audience that we have. So. Uh, for instance, like my dad, he will see a commercial and then he'll hurry up and call me about something. That's marketing in itself. So if we change the way we market certain medications, certain therapies, certain lifestyles that we think people could benefit from, that can help us achieve our goals as agencies, organizations, things like that. So that was mainly uh the main thing that i learned learning the audience and learning how to communicate to that to that audience and that was one of the key things that i learned and and it followed me throughout my uh my academic career okay and that makes sense i, I like the idea of like marketing lifestyles i feel like that, that that's a very brandable thing to, to see in public health so that's dope that you said that so thank you for saying that <laughs> No problem. And there's and and there's like a rise in influencers. That's marketing. So if you in the public health field and you want to be a public health influencer, which I had a, a classmate that wanted to do that from she was from Saudi Arabia. So she wanted to be a public health influencer in her country. And that's a field that she made on her own. So I would definitely suggest that to anyone, to your listeners and your watchers, definitely look into it. Yeah, yeah, and I, I completely agree. And and as we were saying earlier, I feel like medicine, pharmacy, all those if nursing has all, all those people on the influencers already, but public health doesn't have mm -hmm. that and people don't know what public health is compared to all those other like health and medicine related fields, which is interesting to think about. Um, yeah. So so did you know you were in public health doing your health sciences or or when along your path did you figure that out? or figure out about public health? I didn't figure out public health probably until my junior year of, of college. Mm -hmm. um, beginning because I was a part of a fraternity on campus, Alpha Phi Fraternity Incorporated, Ada Kai chapter, shout out to ULM. Um, <laughs> and with my, a lot of the guys that I came in, my line brothers, we were all a part of the health science degrees. So we had someone in nursing, someone in pharmacy, someone in biology, someone in occupational therapy. So me being the volunteer coordinator in doing community uh, service, one of the things we used to do would do uh, just monthly little events or seminars out on the student union building on campus. And so, one day we might do a cervical care, a cervical health um, seminar for women, or we might have a testicular cancer and prostate cancer awareness for the guys. We, we used to do STD um, check-ins, pass out condoms. So that was kind of like what I was doing in the realm of public health, not realizing it. But then I took a class, um, Professor Dr. Paula Griswold, one of my favorite professors, she was teaching a social epidemiology course. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. I, I, I kind of like this. It was, like I said, with the degree program, it was in that class, it was a bundle of health management, health law, uh, psychology, sociology. In that course, you're looking at how our lives, how does that play a role in disease? 
so that's was that was probably my introduction to public health. Yeah, I would say that. Okay, that's dope. And so social epidem epidemiology sounds sounds like a cool class to take. I feel like there are a lot of cool ways you can uh, learn about about social epidemiology. So that's yeah. awesome. Um, so during your undergrad, you were also a campus activities board president at the ULM Student Life and Leadership. So how, how do you get this position and what do you do in it? So in so with that position, it's student voted. So students campus wide voted to have me in place. So which 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 year to. which year was this? This was my this was also my junior junior year going into my senior year. So my okay. last year as well. Okay. Uh, of being an undergrad. So student, I ended up winning the vote of being the president. So it's kind of like those SGA races where you vote for the president, vice president, or those Mr. and Mrs. University uh, campaigns. Okay, so. okay well, well, before you get into the position, how, how did you go about marketing yourself to get the voice? <laughs> Let me hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, I, like I said, I was a part of, part of a fraternity. So they helped me very much. <laughs> and so having that and then having a big group of friends, uh, I would be outside of the student union board passing out flyers. I had someone uh, make little cake balls. <laughs> so I would hand out to get people's votes. We would pass out donuts and juice in the morning, candy. So all those things like that. <laughs> Okay. hanging up posters all around campus so that was a part of my, my campaign strategy right, feeding the people you. and then using my connects <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so, networking mass that's important hey, important things to know it's definitely important that's how you that's how you know people mm -hmm. but um in that role in, as the the president uh the campus activities board it's the role of kind of developing and developing programs for recreational uses for the campus, as well as any type of leadership or educational seminars. So we did a lot of work with, we put on concerts, leadership seminars. We had a lot of speakers come and talk to the campus. So in that role, that's how I kind of got my, my, manage, my managerial experience or my programming experience through that. And a lot of people don't realize, don't know why I put it on my resume, but I put it on there because it was a paid uh, position. I got a monthly stipend as well as got as well as getting my tuition paid for. But it was still a way of me uh, gaining experience, and so that was the the biggest part about being in that role. Okay, okay, that's dope. That is dope. I didn't I didn't know that those types of roles give you like uh, money towards your tuition. So that that is a, a cool tip for people to know about as well. Um, and then also during your undergrad, you were grants management intern at St. Francis Medical Center. So how, how do you get this? And then what do you do in it? Okay. So, and that was, this was when I fell in love with public health. This is when I realized this is what I wanted to do. Um, so in our program, we have to do a practicum or an internship for the last semester. And so we usually give off a list of places that we wanted to uh, to intern with and I chose St. Francis Medical Center in Monroe. And so I worked under the grants manager who is uh, Rebecca Nixon. I love her. She's still one of my closest people to this day, one of my mentors. And so my role in my role under her is I did a lot of the grants research. So for grants, you know, you have to do this. You have to do a lot of research to kind of sell your pitch. So I was doing the research on mortality and morbidity rates in the area. I was looking at uh, low income communities and their access to health. And so combining all that research, I would give it to her and she would apply it to whatever grants that the hospital was looking for. And also in that role, I, we worked with a tobacco cessation program, which was, which is under the hospital where we went to assisted living facilities with elderly people. And we did courses on tobacco cessation. These people had been smoking for 15, 20, 30 plus years of their lives and they decided that they wanted to make a change. So being a part of that was very rewarding. We also did a lot of after school learning and reading um, programs because education is a, a determinative of health as we know in public health. 
And so doing that, um, but the part that sealed the deal for me, we were working on a drug-free communities grant. I think it was with the CDC. And so as I was uh, doing the research and I was finishing up the, the grant, this is, I was also finishing up, uh, I was graduating that spring semester. We submitted it and then I graduated and I kind of left. And so I ended up returning the following fall for homecoming season. And I passed by the, um, the hospital and there it was in all its glory, we were able to get the hospital its first mobile health unit. And that right there, that was when I knew I wanted to do public health. <laughs> that was when I knew I wanted, that was what sealed the deal. Just being able to see the work that I put in come into fruition. And so that was that. Like I said, that was when I fell in love. Yeah, and yeah, and that's great that that you're able to go back and solidify that. And I feel like you got some great like experiences in in that. And just because even even for myself, I I had no clue about like grant writing or that like grant writing processes or anything until I got outside of my uh, until I graduated from my MPH. So getting that kind of experience in, in undergrad, I think, is invaluable. And, and it's just awesome that, that you were able to write the, or help write this grant that was able to get a mobile health health clinic, the first one for a hospital. That, that's some dope stuff, man. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah. So, so, so then you graduated and you became a STEM summer camp director at, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pronounce that incorrectly. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you pronounce it at an African American, <laughs> American Heritage Museum and Veterans Archives. So, yeah. So graduating, I didn't really have a plan. I didn't have anything set in stone. I didn't mm -hmm. know what to do. So I came back home to Hammond and uh, one of my mother's friends, she's, she does a lot of work in the community and in the place where it is, it's the Tanisha Bahoa uh, African-American uh, museum and Tanisha Bahoa, it's a parish. You know, a lot, all the other states have counties, but we in Louisiana, we have parishes because of the French. So that that's <laughs> that's what that word is. That's why that word is so tough because it's French and Indian all mixed together. Um, but there, uh, the museum served as a museum as well as an event center, and it wasn't really getting much use out of the community outside of those two avenues. So um, she talked to the board, and there was a veteran, and who was also a state trooper, Mr. Aaron Williams. He had this idea, this wonderful idea of having a STEM camp in our community, in our city, where kids were able to uh, build rockets as well as get their uh, their fire pilot license, or at least get some credits to go towards getting becoming a fire pilot, a fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as we had people from Geek Squad coming and showing the kids how to break down uh, computers and then putting them back together. We also had someone come and teach uh, the kids how to connect electrical circuits. So just having this uh, program in our community, first of its kind, that was wonderful. And I was asked to be a part of, to kind of be the day-to-day -day manager looking over the uh, facility as well as the uh, students there participated and the volunteers. And it was a blast. I enjoyed it. Uh, I also gained a new respect for educators and teachers <laughs> because you definitely have to be active with, kid, with kids. But uh, like I said, I enjoyed it. Okay. How, how big is, is the uh, city or town that you're from? Like how many people live there? I would say maybe give or take you know, maybe 8,000-ish. Okay. Okay, so it's pretty small, pretty small. And what, what, yeah. what, what was it, the... it might be, and it's grown through the years, so it might be a little bit more than that, but it's definitely a small town. Okay, and what, how many, how, like around how many kids were you supervising and uh, what was the age, age group for the kids as well? Uh, the kids, it was probably maybe like 40 kids, and it was from grade levels 6 to 12, so 6th grade to 12th grade. Okay, that's, that's and so cool. we were able to kind of accommodate each grade level, as well as giving them all the same, uh, the same experiences. Okay. That's dope. That's dope that you got to, you got to go back home and uh, give back to your community in that way. Um, 
So, and then after this position, you went on to become a ER patient's access associate at North Oaks Health System. So where, where is that, first of all? Yes. It's, actually, it's in Hammond as well. Okay. <laughs> so okay. I stayed and after, yeah. So after graduating undergrad, I went home and I stayed there for about two years mm -hmm. before transitioning onto my master's. So I did the summer STEM camp and then I got a position at North Oaks. Um, in that position, uh, working in the ER, you're the per you're usually the first person the patient sees. So you're getting all their uh, medical information, insurance information. You're helping, you're guiding them from uh, registration through triage as well as going to see the doctor. So from there, I I loved working in the ER. Uh, those were some long twelve hours, but. <laughs> um, it, you see everything mm -hmm. from the common cold to there was a, there was, I was there when we had the big Ebola pandemic, uh, I, to seeing traumas coming in and it, it, I enjoyed it. I, and I, I'm one of those people that love medical drama. So just kind of being there <laughs> on the scene, mm -hmm. it really, it gave me a rush. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Awesome. So, so, so tell me this. Uh, you said like during your undergrad, you you were interested in going into health science, high science, health sciences like management, because you want you saw like the idea of like being a CEO. So what was your thought process coming out of like uh, gra graduating from undergrad, or, or were you just not clear on what you wanted to do at that point in time? I had an idea of what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to get my master's. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if I wanted to do. Uh, master's of public health, if I wanted to do, get my public administration, business administration, or uh, I think the other one is health services administration. So I wasn't sure as far as what degree program I wanted to, mm -hmm. wanted to do. And then I also knew I wasn't going to be able to just jump in a management position. So I knew, uh, and, and to anyone that's watching, it's okay to start at entry level, because that's the perfect way you can work your way up. And so me getting in that entry level position actually helped me to progress because starting at the entry level position, learning the ins and outs, being the people that are on foot, learning how, um, learning how people come into the healthcare uh, facilities, uh, types, different types of insurances and types of payments, um, just being a part of the, the wave of emotions patients go through having that human uh, interaction at the entry level in order to make better decisions once you, you know, once you get higher up. Yeah, and, and I think that, that's important because sometimes when you are higher up or you are thinking bigger, you miss on like inefficiencies in the systems or, or how things can be going or different workflows that can change and things like that. Um, so what, what, Actually, let me not, I will ask you that question in a bit. What, uh, so like, what kinds of things did you do in your ER patient access associate? And what, what 12 hour time span usually did you work? Usually in that position, the, the operational thing that I did, I basically, you know, check patients into the ER, you know, got their information, got all their uh, health information, as well as their insurance and their billing information. And then once they see the nurses and the doctors, we will come in and get them, get their consent. And then we'll go to the next patient. That's usually just how it went throughout mm -hmm. the day. But uh, like I said, you can go from seeing the common cold to seeing someone's foot being sawed off. <laughs> and so even, even, even working with traumas, that's how I learned to kind of work efficiently and effectively because Usually those people are your John Doe's and your Jane Doe's. You're getting as much information from the paramedics and then you're kind of uh, waiting for either the patient to come to or they have family members that are soon coming in. So you're also putting those skills to the test. How are you being efficient, effective and getting what you need to do? How are you also um, working with other people that are not on your team? Mm -hmm. Because like I said, like I said earlier, you're in the midst of riding that wave of emotions with patients and their family members. So that was me learning how to work under pressure, not knowing what's going on. 
Yeah, that's that's great. Uh, like real life experience that you can take into so many different uh, atmospheres or environments, I should say. Um, so I have here that you're a credential trainer for Grand Central Cadence Prelude. What is that? Okay, that's basically just the system that we use. Uh, the the electronic healthcare record system that mm -hmm. we use is Epic. And so Epic okay, is okay. one of the well-known softwares that are used throughout the, the country. And that was just one of the, um, I could just say the testing fields that I had to do when I did become the trainer. Cause I worked as just an associate for maybe about a year and a half. And then I was then promoted to be a trainer. And so that was just the, the testing site or being uh, credentialed in the Epic software uh, that I did. Okay, so what, what were the additional uh, job responsibilities or uh, that you had to take on as a trainer? And like, what did you learn from this EPIC training? With the EPIC training itself, I was able to learn kind of like the ins and outs of the software versus just the, what you see on surface base or what associates see surface base. But in addition to what I was already doing as associate, I had, it was my job as a trainer to train new hired employees, not only in the ER, but also in the main hospital, as well as in the diagnostics facilities, uh, as well as our off-campus facilities, because although we have the same system, they're operated in different ways. So there's, the ER operates differently from those, from those that are in the diagnostic center. Those are your people that are getting your, their routine uh, treatments. And that is also different from those that are working in the scheduling um, facility because those people are there just kind of on the phone with the patients or with the insurance companies trying to plan um, the course of action for the patient. So I was able to train people on all those different levels as well as do any type of ongoing training. So I know one of the trainings that I did during my short time as a trainer I had to do a training on Medicare. Mm -hmm. So how are we uh, putting Medicare patients in our system? Mm -hmm. What's the proper way for us to go about this so that not only uh, the patient services are paid for, but how does the hospital get its money as well? Yeah, and those are important things to, to think about. So were you in that posi position for around like six months or so? Yes. Okay. So. When you were in this position, were you thinking about going to graduate school? Yes, I was. I, because I actually didn't get the position at first, mm -hmm. but then something happened with the person. They did, they declined the position, and then I was mm -hmm. given the position. Okay. Uh, so probably around December of 2018, I, I knew I wanted to get my MPH. And I wanted to get the historical black college and university experience. I had never been to HBCU. Mm -hmm. I always love Grambling and Southern for those that are from Louisiana or know about them. Um, so I looked up a uh, master's program, HBCU master's programs. And one of the, one of the ones that stuck out to me was Florida A&M. And they were the top public uh, HBCU. They had an awesome public health program. So, and also during that time, I had two of my friends from undergrad, they were already at Florida a and So uh, one was in occupational therapy and the other was in pharmacy. So I was like, I know people there, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. I submitted it in December, had my uh, interview probably around early February of 2019. I mean, I'm sorry, of 2017. And then I accepted it. I was accepted in March. So I was accepted into grad school while being a trainer, while just being recently hired as a trainer. So I worked that position for, like I said, six months. And then around August, September, I moved from Louisiana to Tallahassee, Florida. Okay. So first for of you, like you, you were saying before that you were trying to figure out Masters of Public Health, Masters of Health Service Administration, Masters of uh, Public Administration. What made you choose uh, public health? I chose public health because I didn't want to be just in one box. I didn't want to be just business or just administration. And public health, um, it allowed me to kind of maneuver 
the way I wanted to because they had health policy management. There's epidemiology, which I was interested in because of the social epidemiology course I took in undergrad. Uh, there was behavioral science and there was also a uh, biostatistics. And I was like, I still have that love for science. So if I'm able to get science as well as business, that would be, I think that would be the smartest move for me. And that's what made me choose MPH versus the others. Uh, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Like even, even for myself, like I was a biology major and <clears throat> I was heavy in science. And I was like, when I'm doing my MPH, as I decided to go into public health, I was like, I want to think big picture stuff because I've, I've been doing like microbiology and stuff and <laughs> parasitology and immunology. And like, I'm, I'm like, let's do something completely different. And yeah. I, I'm glad that I did uh, to, to say the least. So did, did you have a concentration? Yes, in the MPH uh, program, I, my concentration was health policy and administration. Uh, and even though I had, uh, I had management and marketing as an undergrad, I still felt like I needed more or I wanted more. So that's why I chose the, um, the policy and administration, the policy and management uh, course. And also I've always been in the mind that if you, are in policy you you make the rules <laughs> and, and i always tell that when we're in i always say that when we're in discussions in class policy influences behaviors going back to as i said earlier the 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 seatbelt laws that is a policy that's been in, put in place that now people have to change their behaviors for so i always have that in mind if i'm in policy i can make the move i can make the rules yeah, and, and that is like where big systems change happens, you know, policy is one of those levers that, that huge system change can happen around. Uh, so that's dope. Um, so you, I see, I have here that you're a Dolores A. Ozin Fellowship. So what what is that about? That was a, a fellow that Dolores, uh, Dolores Ozin, she was a, um, someone close with Florida a and University and they did a fellowship in her honor. And so at the time I was just looking, I was really just looking for extra money to uh, pay, for, pay for classes because at that time I was a student, I was out of, out of state student. So mm -hmm. you're looking at almost 10 grand a semester. So mm -hmm. I needed some type of assistance. Mm -hmm. So I did that fellowship. I had um, one of my professors who was actually a past recipient uh, write a letter of recommendation. That's how I was able to get that. So that helped me, uh, it wasn't actually like a fellow program, but it was a fellowship as far as getting, um, getting financial assistance for uh, your tuition and for being in school. Okay, okay that's dope. Uh, so, so did you have like any uh, big takeaways during your, your MPH or any like big classes or anything like that that really stood out to you or you wanted to talk about? Um, the big classes, not really, I, but I always, and probably those that are in my cohort, we definitely love uh, environmental health with Dr. Donald Axelrad. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like the environmental health guru in this area, mm -hmm. because even though we only had maybe like two or three people go in that concentration, nobody, cause nobody really had a big um, understanding of what environmental health was. But after you left that class, you knew everything that needed to uh, that needed to be about environmental health, how the environment impacts public health. Um, one of the big takeaways we always make a joke and we blame everything on lead because <laughs> that was one of the um, that was one of the uh, presentations he did it was talking about blood levels and how lead plays a role though through the water we drink how lead plays a role in deterioration of our uh, brain function. So everything that goes wrong, we used to just blame it on lead. <laughs> so that, as far as the classes, that was one of the ones that I really uh, enjoyed. And then of course my internship experiences through the uh, program, I really enjoyed those as well. Okay, and how, how, how big is the, the program? Like how, how, many how big is the program? Yeah, like around how many students do you think? Like a hundred? Um, usually, you no, it's really not. Usually, I want to say cohorts 
can range from 35 to maybe 60 people. And that's between MPH and DRPH students. And that's also people doing online as well. So you can do online or on campus for your MPH and then you do your on campus DRPH. So that's, so it's a very accommodatable size. So you're not like in a classroom full of 600 people that you don't know. Mm-hmm. You literally have the time to get to know your classmates you, and you actually form a bond and you become a, a family, but it's like we say, a family. <laughs> so that, that was what I loved about, <laughs> right? That's what I loved about that experience of being at an HBCU and being at Florida a and You have that, that knit, you make those knit tight relations. Okay, that's dope. Um, so was the internship that you had during your MPH the office automation specialist or was that another uh, position? No, that was actually that was actually a role that I took after my first year. So uh, my first year in the MPH program, I didn't have a job. Mm-hmm. I was living off student loans. <laughs> Don't do it, kids. <laughs> but uh, I ended up getting a position at the, at the Florida Department of Health as a office automation specialist. And in that role, I worked in HIV and I worked in the HIV and AIDS um, statistics area and doing, in, doing surveillance. And I worked on the pediatric cases. So basically being kind of like a caseworker where I would get all the uh, pregnant mothers or the mothers with children, uh, as well as children being born living with HIV and AIDS. And so I would have all those cases and I would input them into our system. And once they're input input to our system, it is then gone to the CDC. And they are able to go through and publish the findings and keep track of the statistics in that realm. Okay, okay, that's cool. And how, how, how did you come across this internship? Uh, connections, being a part of uh, FAMU. Uh, one of the uh, young ladies, Casey Brown, she she was in the DR, she is in the DRPH program. And so she was already working there in the office and they were looking uh, for some males because it was only maybe three, three or four in the office. And so it was, of course, and like our field public health, it's very woman dominated. Mm-hmm. or uh, very woman dominated. So they wanted some more uh, men to be in the office. And so she thought I would be a good candidate. So I was there, I was able to work for, and I did that for about a year and a half, at least up until I graduated and then a few months after that. Okay. Considering that you said the program is kind of small and you have classes with, uh, do you have a lot of classes with the, 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 the RPH students as an MPH student? Uh, not really. Most of the courses, you may have maybe one or two courses combined with the DRPH students. And that's usually, I think one of the courses is our, we have a research methodology course. Mm -hmm. And that's a course that we take with them as well as we took it with students that were in the environmental sciences uh, program, which is separate from uh, our MPH program. Okay, okay. So after this this uh, position and whatnot, you decided to go on to get your doctor of public health at at uh, Florida A and M. So why why what was the thought process for this? For the thought process, I knew I wanted to be, even as a as a young kid, I knew I wanted to be a doctor, some mm-hmm. some sort some fashion. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know you have a lot of people tell you to go back. Go, you might as well do it. You don't have a family. You're still young. You're still full of life. And so, and I also wanted to be one of those people that are at the table making decisions. I knew just stopping at the master's level for me, it wasn't going to be enough. I wanted more. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's why I decided to go forth with the DRPH program. And even in the DRPH program, I chose um, behavioral science and health education because uh, I talked to someone and it's always good to kind of diversify your, uh, your career, your academic career. Uh, Cause as I stated, I already have two degrees that have a background in management, marketing, mm-hmm. health policy and management. 
So I wanted something different. And so if I say policy influences behavior, so let's go ahead and go in the behavioral track and see how I can, how I can uh, kind of fuse theories, how I can fuse these theories together. Okay, yeah, and, and that's a cool uh, process to think about. Before I ask you a question about that, uh, did you have a thought about doing like a, a PhD or, or were you like, no, that, that's too like research-based or what was the thought process for like DRPH versus PhD, if any? <laughs> so I did, yeah, so I did think about the PhD route versus DRPH. And I think the thing, uh, kind of like what you said, it was not that it was too much research because we do a lot of research in DRPH, but um to me with the PhD, you're kind of just stuck in that research realm mm -hmm. and you're kind of stuck with that, um, with that one topic. So if this is your research interest, you stick with that. So if you're doing prostate cancer, usually people with a PhD, they stick with strictly just prostate cancer or men's health, anything like that. Whereas the DRPH, you are more, it focuses more so on leadership and the management as well as the sciences. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted to work in the field. I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to work on the state and federal level of implementing and programming versus just doing research. And so that was my thought process as far as, far as picking between the two. Okay, and that makes a lot of sense. And I'm, I'm glad that you're sharing that just so people can hear it. Um, so you said the concentration is behavioral health and, and what's the other thing? It's uh, behavioral science and health education. Behavioral science and health education. So do, do your courses, are they split evenly between those two or how, how does that work out right now? Yeah, they're, split, they're basically split evenly. Um, we have a health education seminar. We actually have a, we have a lot of programming. Um, classes where we're learning how to educate uh, different groups, different audiences, as well as perform, as not performing, but as well as doing programming. And then of course, the behavioral sciences, um, we're doing a lot of epi courses. So like last summer, I took a, a maternal and child health epi uh, course, which is something that I didn't even know I would be interested in. Mm -hmm. But uh, I enjoyed that uh, last summer, I mean, not last summer, but last fall, I did a cardiovascular epidemiology course. So though we're still getting those sciences, we're learning about the different theories that the behavioral theories that are uh, that we can use to make to do programming and make interventions. Okay, and, and that makes sense. Um, so choosing did you like you, you said earlier that you had a friend who was in your was, was in the drph program i think when you were in your mph program did you consult her about doing fam uh f for the amns uh and dr ph dr ph program compared to another school's dr ph program or, or or were you just like stuck and like i just want to stay here and do this here I was pretty, I was pretty stuck on being at Florida A&M. Mm -hmm. I had considered others. I think I considered maybe a few in Texas because that was another place that I was willing to relocate and that I wanted to go to. But FAMU was kind of, it's kind of like a no brainer. I had the connections already there. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you already kind of become a family. So you already know your professors already so that was kind of, that was one of the things i'm already here i'm getting experience so why you know why mess a good thing up <laughs> <laughs> fair enough fair enough uh, and talk a little bit about how how has the the process of being a student during like covid how, how has that been it's been it's been kind of rough uh for me because i love in-person classes mm -hmm. i like to look at the professor you know right on the right on the the board i love to uh consult with my with my classmates as we're in class so i'm just i like that in-person feel uh transitioning to um being on zoom or teams uh it's 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 been 
been worth the adjust. I've been having to adjust a lot. Uh, sometimes you got to dig a little deep to find that motivation. Do I want to go to class? Do I want to just sit here and listen? But you know, you always kind of keep the end goal in your mind. This is something that I wanted to do. This is something that I put forth. This is something that that is something that I have to go through in order to make my dreams come true. And although it's not happening the way I want to, this is something that is still a part of the journey. And, and you said that you're interested in like implementation and like big level things. How, how do you see your, your DRPH positioning you to do that type of work that you like to do it in the future? I have, it's definitely positioning me to do programming. Um, a lot of, of our professors, even though they have PhDs and they may have PhDs outside of public health, a, a lot of them have done programming and intervention work. And also them kind of um, encouraging me. I've had a professor kind of encourage me to get into programming because she already said, I know you had these big dreams of being like the CEO of a hospital, but I think your heart really is in programming, which it ended up being, <laughs> um, which it ended up being. So having, first off, having the connections, because if you have your name, if Florida A&M Public Health is attached to your name, a lot of people are already going to have high expectations of you. So just having that connect first and foremost, but what I'm learning in these courses, how I'm using, how we're using theories and how that plays a role into intervention. How are we doing translational research going from bench to bedside? Uh, being able to pull public health and healthcare together, uh, it's really helping me. And like I said, with the, uh, the internships that we've done, getting our names out there, getting those skills, uh, working on the state level definitely definitely is uh it's definitely been helpful okay and could you just share like what are some challenges that you see or foresee when when you're talking about like this transitional research or this uh bench to bedside concept like what, what are like some broad challenges in in, the, in that realm i think one of the broad challenges is really trying to change people's and not necessarily change their minds but trying to get people to be open of other ideas so like i said we're so heavily focused on the physicians and medications and the healthcare. that's like even when i talk to when i go back home and i talk to some of our some of our elderly people in the communities or even talking to my parents my dad uh, well, the doctor said this, or this is what's on TV as far as medications. Mm -hmm. Well, no, well, maybe if you change this in your diet, or if you, you know, moved around a little bit more, let's try this, or just maybe take a holistic look all around before, you know, jumping on this type of medication. Yeah, they are the health experts, but there are different avenues. And I think that's one of the things that we have to try to challenge people and open their minds and open their minds to the different avenues when we're going from bench to bedside because um, every sickness, every disease is not just a point A to point B. There are different uh, confounders. There are different things that play a role in the presence of that sickness. So I think just trying to change or try to open people's minds, that would be the, the, the hurdle or the challenge that we may face. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that that's just so important. And it, it's just interesting because there aren't any like as many resources going into like public health infrastructure as, as health systems infrastructure. And as just as a, as a culture, as a society, we're very heavily focused on medicine care or, or like just treatment of, of diseases as, as, as opposed to like preventing it, you know? Yeah, if you if you look at how the pandemic has played out, we are the we are seen as the superior or the most advanced country, but a lot of these other countries who have better public health infrastructure, they were able to contain the virus and to help their citizens 
more than we do because we don't we have a poor public health infrastructure when compared to other countries and so i think and hopefully with this pandemic uh, policymakers, as well as those that are in the healthcare field, they were able to kind of see what changes are needed and how we can get to that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the pandemic has just hi highlighted all the inequities in the system and it has sh shone light and shown just like how, how underinvested public health is. And like this, this pandemic isn't like it, it shows it in a very dark light, but these kinds of issues have been happening to these types of populations from from asthma to, to, to everything in between, you know, it's, it's just like one new thing. And and I hope that this opportunity, like this this light that's being shown on, hopefully that positive change really, really does uh, come about to make those systems change to get better communities all around. Uh, so I look forward to seeing your work in the future. Yes. Thank you, most definitely. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, so you, you currently also work as a medical health care program analyst. Uh, so how, how long have you been in this job and how did you get it? Well, in that position, about a year and a half. So yeah, about a year and a half, I've been a, a program uh, analyst, a health program medical analyst. And in that role, I basically do policy research. So anything on the state level where anything, where I usually listen to, I go and listen to the legislator meetings uh, online, and then also anything that is changing in the realm of Medicaid. So anything that comes from CMS, how does that play a role into Florida's Medicaid? How are the uh, recipients that are under Medicaid, how does that play into their access to getting a physician or getting transportation to a physician, the different uh, waivers that, uh, that help people gain access. So that's basically what I did. I also uh, did a little bit of uh, uh, research for medical devices. So there, there are oftentimes, there are companies there are medical or device companies that are looking to try to get payment through Medicaid or through Florida Medicaid to see if their medical device um, can get reimbursed. The usage of their medical device can be reimbursed. So I did a little bit of that as well. Okay, that's awesome. And yeah, I know like Medicaid transformation or the, the transformation to Medicaid, making payment sources for like social determinants of health type of things is coming. Um, hopefully it comes very soon and those, those policies change so people can get reimbursed for those things that they need. Um, but tell me, like break down how, how do you go, go about like analyzing policies? Like first of all, like do you go to like a certain website or how, how do you listen to those legislative briefs and whatnot? So usually with the legislative briefs, um, and by the time I'm, get, I'm getting to them or by the time I listen to them, it's usually a vote on if we're gonna pass this policy or not. So usually my approach to it is I'm going to the state's legislative website and I'm going to see what policies are already in place. Or oftentimes I'm asked to look at other states and I try to compare policies or I'm trying to see, well, what is uh, Texas Medicaid doing for this certain population? Or what is Washington State doing for this population? So I'm not only gathering or doing research on our state, but also other states as well, other Medicaid programs. How are they facilitating uh, services? One of the big things right now with the pandemic and COVID-19 and the unwinding of the public health emergency, uh, states are trying to figure out what other states are doing. Are we going to continue uh, this way of operations or are we going to alter it? Are we gonna go back to what we normally do or are we gonna alter it? Uh, one of the main things right now is the continuation of telehealth. You know, getting people, let that be a way of access uh, so that was basically, that's basically kind of the approach that I take. Uh, usually it's different for uh, the different states. Sometimes states have their own kind of little database. But uh, outside of that, it's a lot of uh, Googling and, and doing a deep dive into other state 
uh, legislature uh, websites. Okay, awesome, awesome. And that, that's a key tip there for anyone who's looking for like a internship project or something like that. There's so many specific things that you can go into Medicaid and see comparisons or just a policy an, like anal, anal, analyst, analyzing of different policy. I, I don't know why I can't say that word right now, but uh, <laughs> no worries. Uh, so uh, what is the, the most exciting and the least exciting part of, of this role? The least exciting is probably the enormous amounts of reading. Mm. <laughs> so anybody that um, anybody that is looking into uh, working in policy, make sure that you are a lover of reading. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. Of, I like to read, but not a lot. But most of my job is dealing with reading. Um, the most uh, ex Exciting thing, I would say, I wouldn't even say it's exciting, but just being able to kind of look and see what other states are doing, just to see how they're, they are helping people that are on Medicaid. I think that, and then just being just in the, in the midst of these people that have medical devices, like I stated earlier, that, was, that would probably be the most interesting thing. Just learning the different aspects of Medicaid and what it does, because uh, even early on in my career, I just figured Medicaid is for people uh, who uh, who have low income, but Medicaid is far more than that. It's it helps different types. Uh, it helps elderly people. It helps different types of people with people. It helps different people with different diagnoses. Uh, it also helps with transportation. It helps with housing. So it's a lot of avenues with that. So I would think that would be the most interesting part. Okay. And that is cool. That's cool. I was going to ask something, but I cannot remember what it was. Hmm. So are, are, you, are you planning to stay in this position for, for a, a long time? Or are you looking to do any other types of work during your, your DRPH? Well, it's funny that you say that. <laughs> I actually, I actually resigned from that role last week. Okay, okay. <laughs> and I, and I, uh, I accepted a position with the with the Florida Department of Health as a health equity uh, evaluator. So, and when you sent me the um, the title of the podcast episode and all the questions, it was kind of like a full circle moment. Mm. <laughs> because, <laughs> because now I'm in that kind of uh, programming manager, uh, managerial role. Mm -hmm. So being as the evaluator in the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, we service uh, health, um, health related community programs mm -hmm. through, a, through the Closing the Gap grant, which is through the Office of, Minor, my Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. And so my job is the evaluator I will be kind of looking at the performances of these programs, making sure they're hitting their targets, making sure they are servicing the people that they said they are servicing. So, um, like I said, it's a full circle moment. Uh, and I'm glad, I'm excited to, to start in this new role. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm really glad to congratulations on, on the new role. Thank That's you. exciting, man. That's exciting. And I remember what I was going to ask. I was going to ask, um, like, do you, uh, in your DRPH or in your policy uh, analyzing, do you do a lot of like cost or cost analysis or like finance analysis or anything of that sort? Now, I didn't, I haven't done any of that in my, uh, in the bill analysis realm that there may be depending on the type of bill and that there may be a sector where it asks for you know is there an impact is there a cost impact and there may be a little bit of that that goes on but mm -hmm. i haven't done anything too far in depth as far as you know kind of like a cost analysis or anything like that okay and uh, how how do you balance being a drp student as well as working a, a job huh, it's a lot <laughs> but um actually just having making sure that you and your uh, supervisor your manager whoever you're working with have an understanding um and that's what it was for me uh with my manager and with my team i've always let them know that hey this is experience for me this is what i want to do 
but my main goal right now, I'm here for school. I left Louisiana and I came to Florida for school. And so if you're able to, you know, kind of help me find that balance, if I'm able to work, you know, a certain number of hours and then I can go to class or if I can work, you know, over hours and still go to class, anything. And most of my um, supervisors in the uh, roles that I've had, they were very understanding and they allowed me to kind of create a balance where I'm at work for a certain number of hours and then I come and do school or, well, now I've been working I've been working and going to school from home. Mm -hmm. So also just making time out for the two things mm -hmm. as well as making time to step away from the computer screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell, tell me about that. I think you're the first person I'm speaking to that is both doing school from at home and work from at home. How, how do you manage that? <laughs> I'm still trying to manage. <laughs> um, Cause it could be very taxing um you can I don't know if you can get I don't know if it's a real thing I think I saw somebody say something about like screen fatigue and it's a real thing like this is something I'm I'm going to uh, work I'm working Monday Wednesday half of Thursday Friday and then I have classes on Tuesday and then I have a class on Thursday where I'm looking at the computer screen for work and then I get a little hour break and then I have to go back and look at the screen for three more hours for class. Um, with the managing of that, I, I shut my computer off. If, if it's like after work or if it's after class, I physically shut my computer down and I turn the screen off. I at least give myself time to kind of unwind because you still have homework and things like that. I've even gotten to the point where I started back using tablets versus uh, just typing on the screen. So I'll write down stuff first and then I'll just uh, take time out and then start typing it, typing the documents. And also uh, I try to do as much as I can between Monday and Friday. That way, Saturday and Sunday, I don't have to look at the computer at all. <laughs> fair enough fair enough and that seems like a pretty solid strategy that you got there and i hope it, it helps i hope we can get back to some so, sort of normalcy so uh you could uh, at least get out and, and not be locked up on yes <laughs> yeah that's, that's a lot man that's a lot um so where, where would you like to see yourself in the future in the future i would love to uh i have this dream of i guess it's kind of like going back to my ceo dream Mm -hmm. But I would love to be like the Department of Health director. Mm -hmm. I would definitely love to, I think I want to remain on the state level because there's so much that goes on, so much change that happens on the state level that kind of go, that kind of trickles down to the local level. So I think I want to remain in that realm. I've also been uh, looking into consulting. So that could be an avenue uh, that I might, want to take a stab at. And there are a lot of people that are doing public health um, consulting, whether it's in the realm of programming or if they're being like a career strategist, helping other people. I, I'm, that's definitely a uh, avenue that I want to look into. Okay. Yeah. And evaluation is also a big, a big consulting field. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. That's dope. Uh, I look forward to seeing whichever path you you decide to go down and, and I look, I look forward to like reconnecting and we can definitely like chat some more later on. Most definitely. Yeah. So moving on to the last section of the show, the furious five, five questions I ask all guests. Number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? Some advice to students. I would definitely say, don't put yourself in a box. And because public health in itself isn't a box, so don't put yourself in there. So me saying that you don't have to just stick to policy. You don't have to suggest to biostatistics. Allow yourself to grow in the field. Um, like I said, I started out with policy and now I have a love for, for behavioral science. And I do love a little bit of epidemiology. I won't touch statistics, <laughs> but I, but I, I would definitely uh, dial in epi. But like I said, allow yourself to grow and you don't have to be, um, although we all want to be the expert, um, the subject matter expert for one type of subject, but allow yourself to kind of grow into other subjects. I, um, 
like my main research topic is men's health, but I've also had an interest in maternal and child health. So I could also, I can always see how does men's preconception health play a role in maternal and child health or something like that. So allow yourself to grow. Don't put yourself in the box. Explore all that you can. Tell me, tell me more about that men, men's preconceptual health. Cause I didn't ask you about that. Tell me a little bit more about that. What do, what do people not know? Or what should people know about that? Um, well, I will right now, I'm not, uh, not doing preconception. I'm just doing general men's health and I'm okay. focusing on, um, I'm focusing on stress and how that relates to hypertension. But as far as preconception health, um, just men's health in general, getting your, your annual checkups, you know, getting, you know, getting tested uh, every six months or getting tested after you have a partner. How does that play a role? How does your sexual health, how does your lifestyle, how does your lifestyles play a role as you go out into family and then as you go into family planning? Because we often put the, uh, even though um, the mother is the one that conceives the child or she's having the child, a lot, but a lot of that um, medical history, that medical DNA, that health DNA comes from dad also. So dad, dad has to have good health or at least try to uh, change that health history of those lifestyles that he has in order to have a healthy baby as well. Yeah, and I think that's important. So yeah, and I'm definitely and we, and we don't we don't focus on men's health when we uh, talk about uh, women and child welfare. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm I'm gonna loop back to you, and we're definitely gonna have a conversation around that at some point in time. So okay, so yeah, so be on the lookout for that. Um, so number two, if you're talking to someone who wants to get into your position, so your new position, uh, what advice would you give them? Uh, for this new position that I'm in, I would definitely say, uh if you can observe an intern as much as possible, get a, even if it's not paid experience, unpaid experiences do take you far. And I say that because I first was kind of like a shadow or, or, an, an, or I observed this office, the office of minority health and health equity, I observed within my first year of the MPH program. I enjoyed my experience so much that I used them as my internship. So I became an intern within the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. And now after graduating with my master's and being, and now I'm in the doctoral program, I'm now an employee in the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. So definitely if you can observe, if you can intern, get any type of experience that you can, and just me doing the grant research, that helped me become the evaluator of the uh, programs that are funded under this grant. So I already know what's, what's uh, being looked for under this grant. So I just have to uh, use that skill into this evaluation position. Okay, dope, dope. And number three, what's something you're working on improving in your life right now? Right now, uh, career wise and academically wise i want to i've been looking at, at these different database um softwares because that's something that i want to kind of build up more like so you have your SASs, your SAS software and things like that trying to get more in the quantitative uh realm of things so that's something i've been working on as well as trying to um always bettering my programming skills and my communication skills okay so, uh, number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? Um, anything, I because I, I think on the list, yeah, I don't have any books to recommend, but I do have a tidbit. Mm -hmm. So if you are in a MPH program or DRPH program, I would definitely say those classes that you're interested in, or if there's a class that you really want to kind of pursue a career in, buy the book. I know we hate buying textbooks in, for school and sometimes they can be on the expensive side, but if you can find a, a website or, or even if Amazon has it, buy the textbook. Cause I noticed uh, when being in the different professors uh, 
offices, they will always have these books. Like, why do you all have these books? And then I started noticing that, <laughs> I started noticing that I took interest in some of these classes. So I always knew that I might want to go back to the textbook either as a reference or I want to build on, on this type of career or this skill set. So I started buying some of the books. I have maybe like three or four textbooks that I bought from being in the MPH and DRPH program. Mm -hmm. So that, and then I think on the list, you had like some podcasts mm -hmm. or something to recommend. So if you are in public health, I would recommend uh, listening to the Force podcast with Shana Green. Mm -hmm. She's kind of like a career strategist. So if you're, if you're early in your public health career or if you're a public health uh, student in the early stages, listen to her. And then also I would recommend the Health Connect, which is DA Health Connect. They also have a podcast. Um, there are two uh, lovely ladies from Florida A&M University. <laughs> uh, one, Dr. Jonas, she graduated last year. And uh, Artavia, who was actually one of my classmates. So they talk about different uh, issues and topics dealing with public health. So that's another one uh, that I would recommend. And then of course, this podcast right here, the Public awesome. Health Millennium Podcast. <laughs> awesome, awesome. That's great because I, I have not heard of these two podcasts. So I'll definitely have to go and check those out. That's the thanks for putting me onto yeah. those. I appreciate that. Um, so last but not least, where can people connect with you? Uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. My name, Nicholas Alford, A-L-F-O-R-D. Uh, also, I have Twitter, which is Nick, N-I-C, and then my last name, Alford, A-L-F-O-R-D, underscore. And then if you want to follow me on Instagram, you can. It's the most, T-H-E-M-O-S-T, -E underscore. And that's where you can find me. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much for making time to be on the show. I, I look forward to reconnecting and, and just following your journey. Oh, most definitely. Thank you for having me once again. I really, I really enjoy talking about my <laughs> journey and I hope this can, be, this can help somebody out. Oh, yeah. And keep doing what you're doing. Definitely keep doing this. Thank uh, you. Getting the thank you. Like you said, we need more people that are passionate about the field to go out there. So we appreciate you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely sure people are going to take some value from your story. So I'm just glad that you're able to come on today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I'm glad that I got to have Nicholas on, on the podcast today. Definitely trying to be more intentional and trying to get more diverse stories on the podcast. If you know anyone who wants to be on, reach out to me, thephmillennial at gmail.com, at thephmillennial on Instagram. Um, I'm glad to, to be sharing stories. I'm trying to get this down to a schedule. I'm trying to do a lot of different things, but but I, I'm going to try to get this down and just have podcasts coming out every week. And they are definitely new and exciting things coming out as well so definitely stay tuned and appreciate you guys public and millennial out